Hello and welcome back to Ordinary Differential Equations, the video series where we talk about the theory of differential equations. And indeed, in today's part 17, we will revisit the important pika lindelof theorem. This one tells us about the existence and the uniqueness of a solution for an initial value problem. And here we want to extend this result to non-autonomous systems as well. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel steady here on YouTube or via other means. Only because of your support, I'm able to create such video series here. And therefore, as a reward, you get additional material with the link in the description. And with that, I would say we can immediately start by recalling the pika lindelof theorem from part 12. There, we discuss the initial value problem given by an autonomous system, which simply means that the function v here on the right does not depend on the time variable. And then, moreover, if we know that v is Lipschitz continuous, we have a unique solution of this initial value problem. More precisely, v only has to be locally Lipschitz continuous to have this conclusion. And exactly this we have proven in our part 12. However, now in a lot of applications, you might have a non-autonomous system given. Hence, on the right hand side here, the map V gets two inputs T and X in this case. And usually this function is called W then. And now we get two possibilities to consider this initial value problem. Either we do our standard reduction of this system to an autonomous system. Or we completely reformulate the pika lindelof theorem for this case. And since such systems occur a lot in applications, it's really helpful to reformulate the pika lindelof theorem here. And also it gives us the possibility to generalize the whole thing a little bit. However, I can already tell you that we can completely reuse the proof from the original pika lindelof theorem. Okay, so now the crucial input here is that we have a function w defined with two inputs t and x. And therefore for the time variable t, we choose an interval for the domain. And for the space variable x, we have a whole open domain in Rn. So both things here are important to remember. So the best case would be to have the whole domain, so R times Rn. And then the whole thing is mapped to Rn again. So this means we can easily visualize this whole domain here. Just take one axis for t and one for x. This makes sense because on the one dimensional x axis here we really have an interval given. It could be any interval, closed, open, bounded, unbounded. The important thing is it's completely connected. However, then on the other hand, the open set u on the y-axis could be very complicated. But the details are not so important there because we will zoom in anyway. Because we are only interested what happens around the point t0, x0 here. You see, this is exactly the point where the initial value problem starts. So we see we can always find an open set in Rn plus 1 around this given point. And therefore, if we want, we can also find a generalized rectangle that lies completely inside this open set. So just by zooming in here, everything gets much simpler in the description. And therefore often you see this pika lindelof theorem described with such a generalized rectangle. It's not a restriction at all, it's just a description we get when we describe everything locally. And then I would say we are ready to discuss the pika lindelof theorem in this setting. So for example, we could just say we have it for non-autonomous systems. So let's assume we have a function w as before, so a domain in Rn plus 1. And now this function should satisfy a local Lipschitz condition similar to the one we have in the original pika lindelof theorem. However, we can soften this condition a little bit because we only need it in the second argument of w. So there please recall, the Lipschitz condition tells us that the distance in the output space can be estimated by the distance in the input space. 
Hence on the left we get w of tx minus w of ty. And as always we measure this distance in the standard norm of Rn. And now this measured norm should be less or equal than a constant L times the norm of the distance in the input space. So we have x minus y. So you see we don't change so much. We only have a parameter t involved as well. And indeed there you see the simplification we have because the t here on the left can be chosen as the same in both inputs. So by taking the picture from before we can see that we only have to compare inputs that lie on the same vertical line. So this makes it much easier to check for this Lipschitz condition. But still we want to satisfy this Lipschitz condition in the whole rectangle. So we have to consider all vertical lines in it. So we say it has to hold for all points chosen in the rectangle. And I want to call the rectangle capital K. Hence this constant L we have here can only depend on the chosen rectangle K. So it does not depend on the chosen T, X or Y, but it depends on our whole rectangle. Therefore the whole claim here is that for every possible rectangle we find such a constant LK. And now we can also make it more general by saying for every compact set in our domain we find such a constant. This does not change so much, it's just easier to write down. And now finally our local Lipschitz condition as we want it is complete. So if we zoom into a compact set we find a Lipschitz constant such that this Lipschitz condition is satisfied in the second argument. And with that we get the same result as in our original pika lindelof theorem, namely that we have a unique solution of our initial value problem. Namely for a given x0 in u we find an epsilon and a unique solution defined on this interval such that our initial value problem is solved. And moreover you know we can always extend such a solution to a maximal solution. Also I can tell you the proof of this pika lindelof theorem works exactly the same as we have done it in part 12. You might remember it works with the Banach fixed point theorem and a suitable map for it. And this map we called phi and now we just have to adjust it to the new initial value problem. So there we have x0 plus the integral from t0 to t of the function w where we put in s and alpha of s. So that's the whole difference before we just had the vector field v and now we have the whole vector field w. And now you can just adjust the whole proof by using the new Lipschitz condition we have here as well. So it's not a problem at all and therefore this is the version of Pika Lindelof you should take as the general one. However in addition to that I also want to show you a special version of Pika Lindelof which is easier to formulate. This one is also helpful in applications because it talks about global solutions. Now to formulate it as before we also consider the initial value problem here with a continuous function w. However now in addition we assume that we have a maximal domain. So we have r times rn as the whole domain. And this gives us the possibility to consider a global Lipschitz condition. So more precisely we want to satisfy this inequality for every point x and y in rn. So we don't restrict ourselves to compact sets here. We find an L that works for every point in the whole domain rn. So this is a much stronger requirement because now the vertical lines we consider are infinitely long. On the other hand in the horizontal direction in the time direction I still want to cut this condition. So we can say we only consider the interval from minus capital T to plus capital T. Therefore we satisfy the condition for all lowercase t in this given interval. And therefore it's also allowed to choose different constants capital L here depending on our capital T. So in other words this is what we have to put here to the front. There exists such a constant capital LT. And indeed this one should work no matter where we cut the horizontal line here. 
so it should work for arbitrary large capital T. So we can say it works for every capital T greater zero. So in summary, you see we have a much stronger Lipschitz condition here, but in applications, this could definitely be satisfied. And then the result is really nice because we get a unique global solution for the initial value problem. So the solution is defined on the whole domain R. And as before, this holds for our initial value problem with a fixed x0. Now I would say you should remember this result here because it's a nice special result because it guarantees us the existence of the solution for all points in time. This is something that the original pika lindeler theorem cannot tell us. And for the sake of completeness, let's discuss the proof of this special version. And there to make our life a little bit easier, we set t0 to 0. This is not really a restriction, because we could always shift the whole problem to the origin in time. And now as in the original proof, we want to apply the Banner fixed point theorem, which means we need a complete metric space. And you already know from part 12 that this one should be given by continuous functions. However, now here we can choose them given by a large domain, namely given on the interval minus capital T to capital T. And moreover, you know that the standard metric on this space is given by the supremum norm. So for two functions alpha and beta, we take the difference and then we consider the maximum of that. More concretely, we measure the distance in the standard norm of Rn and then we go through all the points t in the domain. It's a complete metric space and now you already know what the contraction is we want to consider there. Namely the function phi from before because the fixed points of this function give us solutions of the initial value problem. However, now the problem here is that in order to show that this phi is a contraction, as we have done it in the original proof, we have to choose a very small capital T here. So if this is small enough, then phi is a contraction. Obviously this does not help us here, because in the end we want to make this capital T larger and larger. Therefore, what we have to do is to change this metric we have on our space x. And in fact, what helps is to include a suitable scaling factor as an exponential function. And what we use there is our constant lt. So we have an exponential function where minus 2lt is a constant and t is our normal variable here. So what happens here is simply that different points get different weights. So if we are large in the time variable, then we scale the points down. And essentially, the scaling is just what works to turn phi into a contraction. However, what you should see here is that the scaling is good, but since we also put in negative times, we should take the absolute value here. This guarantees then that far away points from the origin get scaled down. And now you can check that this thing is still a metric and x with that metric is also still a complete metric space. And with that in mind, we can start showing that phi is a contraction on this metric space. So we just put the images phi of alpha and phi of beta into our metric D. And since x0 will cancel in this difference, we only get one integral inside the standard norm. And there you already know the trick. We can use the triangle inequality for integrals to push this norm inside the integral. The only thing one should not forget here is that the outcome is still a non-negative number. I say this because if you see this integral now and you put in a negative t here, then you would get a negative number. This is simply because this integral symbol has an orientation when it is defined as a Riemann integral. And to avoid this, one can simply set absolute values around the integral. So this is only for the case when we put in negative values for the time variable here. The whole calculation is independent of that, because now we see that inside this integral we have the difference of the w's. Which means here we can use our global Lipschitz condition. It holds for all the points in Rn, so definitely also for alpha s and beta s. 
And now we are almost there, because we just have to introduce the original metric between alpha and beta now. So in other words, we just need to introduce this factor in front of the standard norm here. And this is not hard at all, we can just push everything to the right, and then we just multiply with the numbers. So here in the exponent, we just need our lowercase s. And if we multiply it with the same thing with a positive sign, then we didn't do anything. And now we have it, this whole thing here is definitely less or equal than the supremum of that. In other words, it's less or equal than our distance between alpha and beta. And that's what we wanted, now the metric is back in the game, and now we can push everything outside of the integral. And then there's not much to do, because we only have to solve this integral here. Hence we get the constant 2LT in front. And then we get this antiderivative at the point t, minus the antiderivative at the point 0, which gives us 1. And now finally we see, everything fits nicely together, LT simply cancels. So let's put the factor 1 half in front, and also the distance between alpha and beta. And then we see, we only have to calculate a supremum of 1 minus the exponential function. And there the good thing is, that we have a minus sign inside the exponent. Hence, it does not matter what the supremum actually is, because we immediately see it's definitely less or equal than 1. So our end result here is 1 half times the distance of alpha and beta, which means that our phi is a contraction. And indeed that's all we needed to show, because then we can apply our Banner fixed point theorem. So we get out a unique fixed point, and therefore a unique solution. And by construction of our metric space X, this unique solution is defined on the interval minus capital T to capital T. However, we also know that this whole construction here works no matter what capital T we choose. Therefore, what we actually get is a global solution. We can make capital T as large as we want, so we can define alpha on the whole real number line. And exactly this is what we wanted to show, and the whole special version of the Picard-Lindeler theorem is proven. So you see, we don't need any special tools, we just need the Banner fixed point theorem and a good idea for the metric space. And there we have it, this nice result we can definitely use in the future, especially when we talk about linear ODEs. And this is what I want to do in the next video, there we will talk about linear differential equations. So I really hope I meet you there again, and have a nice day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.